to uh, hijack a few minutes of our time to talk about a couple of little projects. Um, so, and they're really basically both based in artificial intelligence that we're using here at Cedars. First, I'm gonna update you on uh, what we did to use natural language processing to identify aspirin. And then the second part is really gonna be filling you in slash uh, generating my ask of you. Um, so as we all know, aspirin is recommended for at-risk groups. Um, however, um, at the um, in reality, it's really difficult for all of us to remember a list of all of these risk factors, especially since they're scattered throughout and even beyond sort of limitations of chart geography to me, um, there's difficulty in distinguishing the signal from the noise because some of these risk factors are so common. So given all of those limitations at baseline, how do we do as clinicians? Um, well, unfortunately, we only pick up about 23.6% uh, of those for whom aspirin is indicated. Uh, knowing this, then we kind of strove to do better. So we asked how would we do if we even just asked the computer to help us using the fields available in the electronic health record, age, BMI, et cetera. And we were able to double our detection rate to about 58%. And then we got fancy and applied natural language processing, a type of artificial intelligence, and we dialed that up even further to 73%. So that was pretty exciting, and our next step was to actually take this to practice for those whose prenatal record is in the CEDAR system. We implemented this best practice alert, and then if accepted, it would auto-place an order for a baby aspirin. And of course, while many of us feel that we could use another EHR best practice alert, like we could use a hole in our head, the reality is it's actually been working. So about a third of the time clinicians accepted the order, another over a third of the time clinician canceled it because they'd actually, Smarty Pants already recommended aspirin. So in total, now we're documenting 69% of the time the patient received aspirin when they would not have necessarily, or at least we would not have known they did. And maybe what's most exciting to me, at least, is that we actually also eliminated the racial disparity. So in the past, Black pregnant patients were almost 10 times as likely not to have aspirin given despite it being indicated. But in this iteration, using the best practice alert, the racial disparity has been um, eliminated. So we're excited to continue to do better um, for this. Um, but what I'm actually here to sort of uh, hijack the presentation for is to ask y'all's help with this partometer project. So this one's really been about five years in the making now, and it's what I call the partometer, or basically a clinical decision support designed to use automated machine learning to predict your probability of vaginal delivery. Our objective then was to reduce the disparities in care by adding this real-time sort of ongoing guidance, or to put it more directly, sort of taking our grease board and adding something like this. Um, an ongoing predictor visible to clinicians and other staff to predict the probability of vaginal delivery. So after all of this work, how are we doing? Um, well, actually pretty well. So this is a look at over um, time, the partometer's prediction for probability of vaginal delivery. We specifically focused it at four hours. And as you can see, our, our accuracy at four hours is almost 90% and our discriminatory ability is very good. So, but in fairness, um, that was data really based in the past. What about predictions from the completely differently fashioned 2022-3, no, future? Um, and so we move on then to really our next step, not just sort of describing and trying to predict, but really kind of doing, you know, a head-to-head -head matchup. So who between the doctor and the um, computer can better predict the eventual outcome of their patient's mode of delivery. Um, so this is something I don't do on the back end. This is actually where I ask um, for y'all's help. So what does this translate to? Uh, well, basically a as short as a feasible uh, survey. So um, at various points in your patient's labor, typically about four hours in, you're gonna get a text message from me with this, and it's got this fun little slider at the top, and you basically rate how likely you think your patient is to have a vaginal delivery. And bonus, if you've answered relatively soon after asking, that's it, because we'll sort of triangulate who we texted right then, what you enter as your name, you know, in the drop dropdown, um, and then we can figure out the rest about who the patient was. So our hope is to be able to assess the calibration of the partometer to see whether it was more or less or the same capability for predicting early on the probability of a vaginal delivery for laboring patients. So I'm gonna thank you all um, for your attention. Happy to answer um, questions about this offline uh, via email. Um, unless somebody generates one while I switch over to uh, introducing Dr. Rimel. Cool. So um, I now have the absolute pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Rimel. 
<sighs> so um, uh, where do I even begin? So Dr. Rimel completed her medical school at Duke, did a residency at Northwestern, and then fellowship in gynecology at Wash U in St. Louis. We were then lucky enough to recruit her um, directly to Cedars and have held her close ever since. Um, Dr. Rimel's expertise is in fact so varied that as I look through her CV, I've opted to break this up into skill sets. Number one, digital health. Dr. Rimel's spearheaded research for her, a digital platform for recruitment to cancer clinical trials way before doing online consenting was cool. This yielded her the 2013 Award for Excellence from the um, Health Improvement Institute and was instrumental in growing our own cancer registry. She also consulted for Deep Six AI, turning it from a glorified free text Google search into an actually usable tool for cohort building. Number two, medical education. In addition to having won numerous teaching awards, Dr. Rimel has held a steady, ever patient connection to our medical students, initially serving as the site and course director for the OBGYN clerkship at Cedars and now as the sub director. Number three, as my mother in law would call it, the gays. LGBTQ health. Dr. Rimel has co led the LGBTQ Research Committee and delivered the first of its kind, first ever LGBTQ Cancer Symposium at Cedar Sinai. She's also given talks out and about in the community, including on cervical health and for those, uh, including for those identifying as TGI ENBY, and providing expertise to Patient No More, a documentary film exploring the barriers LGBTQ women navigate across healthcare systems. And number four, finally, in her her actual day job as a gyne oncologist and researcher. Accomplishments too numerous to list. Nonetheless, I will do so now. A, Dr. Rimel is an absolute boss of therapeutic clinical trials, including serving currently as the PI on no less than eight clinical trials, including those of PARP inhibitors, immune checkpoint inhibitors, really all the inhibitors. B, Dr. Rimel has multiple sources of active funding, including a GOG Career Development Award, four pending NIH R01s, and all of this has yielded no less than 61 published peer review manuscripts, four book chapters, chapters and membership on several key committees for SGO, including clinical practice and the diversity inclusion task force, and further yielded her new position as our own medical director of cancer clinical trials. And I would be remiss to mention that she has done all of this while gestating then raising two small humans who are both delightful and statistically significantly brilliant and being partnered with a larger human, Emily, who plans unequivocally the best vacations ranging from a private island off the coast of Indonesia to space camp in Huntsville, Alabama. You can guess which one of those we snuck in on. And so with all of that, I give you the Dr. B.J. Rimel. Wow, that was the most amazing introduction I have ever received and thank you Melissa uh, for making me blush and wiggle all of my chins at the same time. Thank you. All right, so um, today I'm gonna talk to you about a subject near and dear to my heart as soon as I magically share my screen. Um, we're gonna talk about endometrial cancer. Um, this is a topic that actually got me into uh, G1 oncology. Um, my former boss used to say this is the redheaded stepchild of GYN cancers, but I really feel that that's starting to change. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is endometrial cancer, a little bit about its history and its course, and whether or not we're really picking the right targets to study. And I will, um, full disclosure, talk about my own research. So these uh, more disclosures. <laughs> I've been an advisory board participant for several uh, clinical trial companies, uh, and as well as Melissa mentioned, I consult for Deep Six AI. Okay, so talking about this, uh, we're going to do a brief history of endometrial cancer, talk a little bit about the current scope, the incidence, the changes over time, and the racial disparities. We're going to talk a little bit about the early targets that have been studied, including estrogen, increasing use of HRT, and the induction of introduction of progesterone therapy. Modern targets, including DNA mismatch repair, Lynch syndrome, uh, the TCGA, which is the Cancer uh, Genome Atlas Project, and we'll talk a little bit about how that's impacted a lot what we do in endometrial cancer, um, and uh, the uh, methylation studies uh, and DNA mismatch repair. Okay, so clinical trials, we're also going to talk about that briefly because they relate to the different targets that have been uh, figured out, and we're going to talk about my personal favorite study, GY12. Okay, so endometrial cancer, uh, the estimated incidence currently is about 65,000 patients estimated in 2000, yeah, 2022 with about uh, 1,200 or 12,000 deaths. So to put this in context, ovarian cancer is about 19,000 new cases in 2022 with 13,000 deaths. So endometrial cancer has, uh, because of its increased incidence, has a similar uh, incidence of death in our population. Um, and this incidence varies over different populations. This incidence has continued to rise over time. We had a steep decline uh, after the 1970s, uh, but we have had an increasing rise in incidence, including uh, in worsening disease states. 
we can see that the incidence of uh, uterine cancer is variable over uh, the United States, uh, with the highest rates of incidence uh, in uh, certain states in the New England uh, and less rate of incidence in the South. But this doesn't make a lot of sense, but it has to do partly with how uh, disease is captured and what we consider to be the accuracy of reporting. Um, but if we think about where the population of our country lives, this is a uh, this uh, the CDC and uh, Census Bureau uh, data on where people who identify as white live compared with people who identify as black live. You can see that these uh, differences are are not not easily uh, attributable to anything other than just um, uh, history uh, and location. And then we know that recently, especially in the New York Times, we've been able to identify that uh, and it's been shed more light on that uterine cancer is on the rise and especially among black women. And the mortality rate is actually uh, highest among black Americans. And this shifts our focus again to see the disparities that are inherent in endometrial cancer and wonder, are we really hitting the right targets that we need to hit? And can we figure out a way to treat this cancer better, not only by early identification, but by uh, figuring out why certain populations are at higher risk? So the question that we had to ask is, do uterine cancer mortality trends vary by tumor characteristics according to race and ethnicity? And this is the paper that really spawned that uh, New York Times article. And what the Clark et al. noticed, and this is published in JAMA Oncology this year, is that in a very large cohort study of over 200,000 women with uterine cancer, that they noticed that the mortality rate uh, annually increases uh, for patients in different populations, specifically uh, in Asian women, in Black women, Hispanic women, and white women were, uh, were different, but were irrespective of histologic type. And then increasing uterine cancer mortality was associated with increasing rates of aggressive non-endometrioid carcinomas, but that racial and ethnic disparities could not solely be explained by histologic subtype and stage. So what does that really mean? It means that the populations that were at risk had different types of cancer, but it could not solely be explained by this. Even the lower stage and lower risk patients uh, in different populations were at increased risk of death. This is a figure from the uh, JAMA Oncology paper demonstrating uh, the uh, increased rates of uh, non-endometrioid uh, cancers. Those are panels C and D. And you can see that for Asian patients um, and Black patients, there are uh, increased rates of uh, histology. So what were the, some of the earlier targets uh, for endometrial cancer? Actually, estrogen. So it was noted very early on, actually, by Schroeder in 1922, that estrogen-secreting tumors of the ovary resulted in endometrial cancers. And estrogen was actually first purified in 1923, but ovarian extracts had been used long before that for postmenopausal symptoms. It turns out that we know that estrogen receptors are present all over uh, the body, in fact, but highest uh, in the uterine tissue, next in the vagina. And it turns out that hormone replacement therapy became exceptionally popular in the 50s and 60s, um, with uh, white men telling us that uh, we that women of the time should definitely uh, be kept in this way, which apparently is to be serving cocktail uh, cocktails and dressed uh, formally uh, and very hungry while they don't eat and everyone else does. Um, Early on, uh, it was identified that this hormone replacement therapy uh, was actually very dangerous uh, to women. And this commentary uh, put out in 1980 really de described the epidemic of uh, endometrial cancer in women who were taking hormone replacement therapy, which at the time was an estrogen alone therapy. Estrogen, as we just talked about, is highly, estrogen receptors are highly present in the uterine uh, lining. And because of that, uh, results in a tenfold increase uh, in endometrial cancer without. We also noted uh, in the original Million Women study that continuous uh, combined uh, oral contraceptives uh, when they were used uh, had a decreased rate of breast cancer or endometrial cancer rather than estrogen only, uh, which is seen on the, on the right. And then having no uh, use of HRT actually was showed a reduction in breast cancer, but really didn't make much difference in endometrial cancer. And this data actually brought forward the idea that the, the progesterones themselves might be pro, uh, protective. So uh, hormone replacement therapy, estrogen therapy uh, was a target of prevention. And by reducing the amount of estrogen alone therapy or just the amount of estrogen uh, provided, we could decrease the amount of uh, endometrial cancer. Um, 
uh, suggesting that even though there was some benefit for estrogen replacement therapy and other things like hip fracture in general, it really wasn't recommended uh, for endometrial cancer and did show an increase in breast cancer in some of the earlier data. So this led us to really focus on the use of progesterone for treatment. So two GOG studies evaluated the efficacy of hydrose progesterone, referred to as megestrol acetate, and the brand name is called Megase, uh, in advanced endometrial cancer patients. And both studies demonstrated modest responses with response rates around 20%. This was very revolutionary to use a hormone in GYN cancer. And for many, many years, in fact, for over 16 years, maintained as the standard and only FDA-approved therapy for endometrial cancer. And low-dose regimens were as effective as high-dose regimens. So we started out with 680 milligrams every day, and we're able to wean that down to 160 milligrams twice a day. Um, there are significant side effects to progesterone therapy, specifically weight gain, increased risk of venous thromboembolism, and depression. And that depression can't be understated. Um, patients who receive these kinds of therapies, even today, need to be quickly monitored for uh, depressive symptoms. So if this is all true, we got rid of the estrogen that was probably driving some of the earlier uh, cases of endometrial cancer in the 60s and 70s when estrogen alone and high-dose estrogen alone therapy was used as hormone replacement therapy, why are we still seeing these endometrial cancer rates rise? There's more. Okay, so it, the second target that we're going to kind of talk about is obesity. So uh, obesity prevalence uh, continues to rise, and you'll see that you may notice that some of these states continue to overlap with some of the places where uh, populations with higher uh, minorities uh, live. And this is, uh, again, secondary to uh, location, structural racism, and other issues, food deserts, um, inability to access uh, easy uh, and healthy uh, options, and lack of uh, education. But this is a serious problem and continues to rise. So in 2021, uh, you can see there are only two red states uh, reporting over uh, 30%. Um, but the prevalence uh, continues to rise, and the prevalence of obesity among U.S. adults aged 20 to 74 rose to 50% um, with the most recent count. I couldn't find a better uh, one for this, but we're not getting any better after the pandemic. So why does this happen? Why do we care about obesity? And is it the same target that we were talking about before with estrogen? And it's true and not true. In this schematic, we're sort of describing how adipose tissues um, create androgens and that uh, aromatase uh, essentially will create uh, these uh, androgens into estrogens, which can then uh, affect the growth of the endometrial lining, causing proliferation and ultimately uh, hyperplasias and cancers. So this was. Uh, Moving on to modern targets, uh, so Andrew Walth Warthin uh, published about the heritability of cancers uh, in 1913, and he was the first person to actually describe Lynch syndrome, but not the first person to clinically act, uh, act on it. Lynch syndrome, as probably everybody already knows, is the, uh, the systemic germline uh, mutation of a, a disorder of DNA mismatch repair in one of four genes, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, or PMS2. These genes are causal for Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome is the uh, hereditary, uh, hereditary cancer syndrome that includes colon cancers um, and endometrial cancers for women. Endometrial cancer for women with microsatellite uh, instability or DNA mismatch repair gene mutation um, can be a, as high as 50% in some families and is likely to be the presenting cancer for most women. And microsatellite instability, which is the uh, DNA effect of loss of DNA mismatch repair, um, can actually be caused by promoter methylation of MLH1. So a person can actually have a tumor that is uh, microsatellite instable, but not have a germline mutation uh, resulting in loss of MLH1. And it turns out that this is a very common uh, phenomenon in endometrial cancers and present in uh, promoter methylation is present in about 77% of tumors that have MLH1 loss on IHC. So this represents about 20% of all endometrial cancers and has become a real focus for us in terms of target therapy. So this is the TCGA. The TCGA was the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. It was a huge NCI funded endeavor to start to, oh, hello. Uh, to start to uh, really get into the um, the DNA and the genomic output of all these different kinds of tumors. 
And so they sequenced a little over 300 tumors for endometrial cancer. And they did the same thing for all fairness with ovarian and cervical and other uh, important tumors. But uh, for, for endometrial cancer, what they noticed after sequencing about 300 uh, tumors is that they could, uh, with a fairly good certainty, divide them into four groups. One group was called POLE, significant for uh, an ultra mutated group uh, defined by the presence of a tumor uh, mutation in an enzyme called POLE, which results in these sort of bizarrely, terribly mutated tumors that are exquisitely sensitive to treatment for the most part. A hypermutated or MSI population, so those uh, tumors that had uh, Lynch syndrome gene mutations, such as MLH1, MSH2, PMS2, MSH6 or those that had MLH1 methylation, like we talked about, that would also result in microsatellite instability. And then there are two other groups, the copy number low group, or the microsatellite stable group, and the copy number high group, or cirrus light group. And we understand a little bit more since 2013, but let me just basically say that the two on the left, POLE and MSI, have a much better prognosis than the two on the right. Um, and despite that, unfortunately, that uh, more than half of patients will have a tumor uh, categorized by on the right. And so uh, therapies are really needed to focus on these two extremely uh, worrisome groups. So as I mentioned, MSI high tumors and poly tumors uh, are characterized by their wildly dramatic mutational status. And because of that, hey, because of that, they make a lot of neoantigens. All those really bizarre uh, mutations result in a lot of really bizarre proteins, even if they're truncated, which means that these neoantigens are bits of proteins expressed by the tumor cells that may be able to sensitize an uninhibited immune system. This concept uh, was put out uh, in 2015 and really changed how we think about immunotherapy. So these sort of self-vaccinating tumors are creating a bunch of little bits of protein that if our immune system was awake enough to see, could actually attack the tumor directly. And so uh, these tumors, mismatch repair deficient tumors, which had a lot of new antigens, were included in the very first study by Lee et al. in the New England Journal in 2015, come on computer, um, that uh, demonstrated an extremely strong response to the first of the checkpoint inhibitors, pembrolizumab, uh, in endometrial cancer. Um, and this was really exciting. So if you look at the waterfall plot, you can see that mismetropare deficient non-colorectal cancer, because of course it was a colorectal cancer doctor that did this, but that's all endometrial cancer had the best and strongest responses. Okay, so fast forward a little bit, 2017 arrived with the FDA approval of the very first cancer treatment for any tumor with a specific genetic feature. So we've been talking about this forever, about how amazing uh, it would be if we had targeted therapy that was pan-tumor, tumor agnostic, but really just looked at the mutational status or the functional status of the, the tumor itself. And this was the very first time that this was done. So it's extremely exciting. Um, and that was the approval of pembrolizumab uh, by the uh, FDA in 2017. If you don't remember 2017, this is what uh, should have been on your playlist at that time, as these were the top three songs. I'm just trying to keep the residents interested. <laughs> All right. So what about the patients that had those tumors on the right? We talked about how the tumors on the left, uh, poly and MSI, can be treated with uh, pembrolizumab. What about them? So it turns out that linbatinib and pembrolizumab uh, was a combination uh, investigated to, come on, uh, was investigated to have uh, the ability to overcome the lack of microsatellite instability. So even tumors without DNA mismatch repair, could they be stimulated to behave in the same way that microsatellite instable tumors did if they were given linbatinib? And linbatinib turns out to be a very promiscuous naughty tyrosine kinase inhibitor that basically targets everything and cause enormous amount of cell disruption, resulting in uh, cell death that creates a lot of that sort of broken up uh, neoantigen type gamish. And so the combination of lenvatinib and pembrolizumab had great preclinical data and Vicky Mocker, who's a friend uh, and a super smart scientist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, brought this trial together. And this was the first phase two study. Basically, what they did was investigated in a phase two fashion, an open-label single-arm study, the combination of an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor that you have to take once a day with pembrolizumab, which is IV once every three weeks. And they looked to see if this would do what we hoped it would. 
sorry, my computer's doing crazy things. OK, so fast forward, we're uh, the objective response rate in this trial in patients that had DNA mismatch repair, so those are the 11 patients on the far right, um, showed a response rate of 63%. For the patients that had uh, micro, that were not microsatellite stable, that's the middle column, there was a 36% rate of response. So we know that pembrolizumab alone in that population had a nearly zero rate of response. So to get 36% with the combination was really outstanding. And to get 63% in the population that had DNA mismatch repair was also really exciting, potentially thinking that maybe we could overcome for some patients that have developed resistance to pembrolizumab alone, maybe the combination would be helpful. And that data is actually emerging now. So this is what it looks like if you look at the different histologic subtypes, and you may remember from way back at the beginning that the histologic subtypes were the some of the areas where we were concerned that there was racial disparity. It turns out that serous and endometrial car carcinomas, so both the uh, type 1 endometrial adenocarcinomas that are classically associated with estrogen receptors and obesity, are just as sensitive as some of our serous carcinomas, uh, which are not associated with obesity, it's associated with uh, uh, greater age, um, so older patients, and uh, also P53 mutation. And they're just as sensitive uh, to this combination therapy, which was absolutely outstanding and really goes to show uh, the value of the preclinical data. So we're still missing most people, right? We're only getting a response rate in the second line of 36% of people. And when you're counseling a patient in the office, it can feel very devastating to say that this has very little chance or this has only a modest chance of really working when this is the only standard second line therapy. So what can, what else can we do? We don't want to forget about our other patients and we're not in the office. We're always thinking about something else we can do. So the TCJ also identified some other genomic events that we never really went after. So in, uh, in 2015, uh, we had a big conference and talked about some of the other things that we could try to investigate. And one of those things was uh, DNA damage repair mechanisms outside of DNA mismatch repair. So DNA mismatch repair is everything that uh, the MSI population is doing. We're talking about things that transcend that. So ARID1A, P10, P53. So this is a uh, a schematic sort of explaining about the different places where we thought we would try to target. And this happened uh, in uh, 2015, 2016 uh, at part of the uterine task force committee, which I was very excited to be a part of. Um, and at that task force committee, we gathered a lot of the available data on molecular targets for endometrial cancer and came up with several different uh, ideas. One was to target hypoxia uh, with drugs like sidirinib that would talk uh, that would target uh, specific uh, abilities of tumor cells to recruit blood vessels. The second was uh, the idea of doing failed DNA repair. And the third was um, looking at a cell cycle uh, connector like AZD1775 that is looking at V1, which is actually part of the P53 mechanism, which I could spend a whole hour talking on, but I won't. So if we think about removing the the removing the uh, high, the oxygen from the tumor, we're actually, it's very similar to a steam train removing uh, all of its water. So if you're running a steam train and if you run out of water, the uh, all the steam tubes will actually explode. And that's very similar to what it looks like under the micrograph of what happens when you remove the oxygen from one of these tumors, which is what sidirinib does. Similarly, if you do a DNA, if you have DNA mismatch repair and you use a PARP inhibitor like Laparib, you're basically unable to complete that string of double-stranded breaks, and the train or the transcription factors will basically fall off the DNA, and the cell will ultimately collapse from lack of uh, being able to uh, repair its single-stranded and double-stranded breaks. And last but not least, when we're talking about a drug like We One, we're basically putting a full stop. Uh, and uh, where the DNA mismatch or DNA repair machinery rather doesn't recognize that that stop is there, will barrel on through and there won't be a proper end. Um, and so like the train falling out of the train station, um, there isn't a proper stop to uh, the polymerase and what happens is basically the cell uh, dies. So with these things in mind, we came up with a big rationale for these three to 
these three drugs and decided that we would uh, move forward with this. And as I mentioned, the response rate to second line therapy at the time was uh, very low. Uh, second line therapy outside of immunotherapy is only 10 to 15 percent with an approximate progression free for survival of only three months. So we made the rationale that we have great data that sidernib alone has a very small response rate, but is reasonably well tolerated with a, uh, pr a progression or a PR rate of 12.5%. Uh, so PR is a partial response rate, meaning the tumors will shrink about 12% of the time. Olaparib is well studied, and at the time that we were working on this, uh, was very popular in ovarian cancer. Um, and we know that the combination uh, together was active and tolerable in the treatment of ovarian cancer. And so we developed this concept that we could use it in endometrial cancer. And so this was the original study design of GY012, which was uh, a platform study design, the very first of its kind in endometrial cancer, which I had the privilege of, have the privilege of being one of the PIs for. So this is using this combination of three drugs, an anti-angiogenesis drug, sidernib, a DNA uh, repair machinery drug, olaparib, and the combination alone and looking towards progression. We were very fortunate that this study came out at a time when there were no competing studies and our enrollment was exceptional. Um, and it was the fastest enrolling study ever, which is really just timing. Um, and then I was able to be able to present this at our uh, national meeting uh, way back in the day, uh, like 2021. Uh, where we talked about what we found. And basically we had 40 patients per arm. We had really good distribution. Um, I don't know if you can see, but we have um, uh, uh, about most of the patients had had at least one prior chemo. Uh, about a third of them had had two. Um, very few patients at that time had had immunotherapy and about half had had radiation. Uh, most of the patients uh, maintained their treatment, uh, uh, except for those patients on Olaparib. You can see the big difference there. Olaparib was definitely not a winner. That's a spoiler alert. Uh, we had some patients withdraw from treatment, uh, some because they just didn't like what arm they got randomized to, which is always a risk um, in an open label study. Um, the ev adverse events or the toxicities or side effects that we saw with the drugs was actually as expected. Our biggest problems were hypertension and diarrhea and fatigue. Um, but these are pretty well tolerated, um, and we had very low rates of venous thromboembolism and only uh, one grade five uh, in sidernib, one in olaparib, and two in sidernib and olaparib, and none related to study drug. Um, so this is our uh, biggest slide. This is to progression-free survival, and this is a Kaplan-Meier curve looking at the three arms together. The one that we wanted to win, of course, was the combination arm, and it did a little bit better, but it didn't meet statistical significance by 0 0.01. So if only one person had stayed on one more cycle, we would have been successful, but we were not. And that is the, just the way that it goes. So we did not meet our primary pre-specified statistical endpoint, but the combination of Olaparib and Sidernib was, uh, had a median PFS of five and a half months compared to Sidernib alone at 3.8 months. And everything was better than Olaparib. So we really did plant a flag in, please don't go here. It's not worth it. We did notice that for some of our patients with Bocerus and endometrioid histology that we had some remarkably long duration of responses. In fact, this uh, slide just shows up to 18 months because that's when we were censored and had to pull back on some of our questions, but we were really able to show uh, we actually had four patients that went on for more than two years on the uh, combination therapy, and that was really exciting to see. Uh, what might be sig significant about those patients uh, who are better responders. Well, with the success of this, we were then able to propose to the NCI that we be allowed to start the very first rolling platform study, which means that instead of just having a phase two study that ends, you actually add more arms and more combinations that allows you to maintain the study machinery, decrease costs, uh, improve uh, your ability to uh, keep patients and sites interested in maintaining uh, the study and hopefully uh, allow a quicker turnaround for drugs to patients. And so we proposed a, a secondary, uh, uh, what I call a rainbow of fruit flavors study to uh, the uh, NRG and they accepted. So we were then able to proceed with several new arms, which are now uh, the first platform, the secondary platform arms. Uh, and uh, this was really exciting. Uh, they allowed us to bring in arms while maintaining the arms that we had. So ultimately, after much discussion, we were able to move forward with three new combination arms, maintaining sidernib as the reference arm. So uh, the study is now a forearm study, and we have three new combinations. And I'll talk a little bit about this because this is really what my research has focused on over the last couple of years. 
So uh, this is my arm, my baby. Uh, this is Olaparib and Dervalumab. So despite the really exceedingly poor performance of Olaparib, which is the PARP inhibitor, um, the combination in, uh, in concert with immunotherapy actually has some merit. So it turns out that there's this cool pathway in how the immune system uh, sees uh, the body where dead cells or virus or retrovirus or bacteria uh, all get uh, internalized into the cell, get broken up into little pieces. Um, and what happens then is the PARP inhibitor um, can come in and see all of this uh, and, and uh, will actually generate more of that uh, broken up DNA. So kind of like making more neoantigens, it does that again. And what happens with this CGAS sting pathway is that you activate this pathway and it stimulates the production of uh, type 1 interferons, which can help recruit uh, T cells to the area and induce anti-tumor immunity. In concert with an immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitor like dervalumab, uh, which should also help recruit and uh, modify T cell response, the combination itself should be uh, better than either of the drug alone. And this was borne out really well uh, in uh, preclinical models that suggest that this would work. And there's a nice picture of a mouse model where if you give them the combination drug alone, so BMN675 is another uh, PARP inhibitor and an anti pd one which is like dervalumab, if you look at the bottom of that little mouse model where the tumors get really teeny, that's basically what we're hoping will happen for our patients. The phase one had already been completed when we presented this, and it was really exciting because there was a disease control rate of 83% uh, for the phase one population, which is really lovely. So that means that patients are receiving some benefit even without tumor shrinkage, um, and it, they had at least four months for stable, uh, for stable disease, which still beats out the two months of the lap or balone. So we had a good dose. We had a great model. Some of the other arms that we looked at are looking at sidirinib and dervalumab. This is very similar to the lenvatinib story in that we expect that these uh, hypoxia-inducing drugs like sidirinib uh, in combination with a checkpoint inhibitor like dervalumab will uh, lead to better treatment than either alone. Uh, and we have great preclinical data for this. And as sidirinib is better tolerated than lenvatinib, as any anyone will tell you, there's a great... Uh, joy in putting this forward, even if the response rate isn't better, if the tolerance is better, this could become the new second line. And then last but not least, this data comes from uh, Shannon Weston, who is a great colleague out of MD Anderson. And Dr. Weston has worked really hard on AKT inhibitors, specifically capiv assertive. So a lap rib is a PARP inhibitor, capiv assertive is an AKT inhibitor. Who cares, right? This is really important. It turns out that AKT um, is one of the signaling mechanisms uh, through which uh, we see a lot in endometrial cancer through P10 and PI3K. And basically what happens if you treat uh, tumors with a laparib and with a PI3K inhibitor or an AKT inhibitor, which is an upstream target, you will get incredible synergy. And that's what's in the top right. So this uh, demonstrated some really nice data. And then she was able to do a uh, phase one study, uh, 1B study down in the bottom right corner, where you can see that both in endometrial and ovarian patients, she saw some really nice responses. Um, and so this led us to be able to include this as arm number four in our platform study. So this study is enrolling now. Um, it's really exciting. We're about to reach our interim analysis with 60 events. Um, and we, enrollment has really picked up over the last few months, so we're really excited uh, about seeing this move forward. So more to come on that. So the question that I posed at the beginning, um, I'm going to try to answer uh, a little bit now. Um, are we hitting the right targets for endometrial cancer? Yes, I think that we've identified that estrogen-driven proliferation is not good for us. I think we've identified that hormone therapy with progestins uh, needs to be standard of care. We want to avoid estrogen-alone therapy. As a person who practices GUI oncology in Beverly Hills, I can tell you that this message is not reaching everyone. Um, that I still see a patient every month with an endometrial cancer that's completely preventable because they're on estrogen alone therapy. So we really need to make sure we're keeping the word out um, for patients that uh, if they're going to be on estrogen alone, uh, they, they need to be really careful uh, about uh, having a uterus and maybe uh, they don't need one. Um, so the next target that I think we're hitting really, really well is for microsatellite instable tumors. So for patients with either a germline Lynch syndrome mutation or patients that have MLH1 methylation, immunotherapy alone has been magical. Uh, we had the privilege of having Keynote 158 open here. That was the original study with pembrolizumab. And we have two patients that were on that study that remain without evidence of disease four years after the study closed and have been off all treatment for more than two years. 
I don't have anybody else like that in my practice. I hope I live long enough to see everybody in my practice looking like that, but that's been a real game changer for us. Um, and I can't say enough good things about the people who are studying immunotherapy as a uh, target for cancer. For microsatellite uh, stable patients, the combination of pembrolizumab and lymphatinib has allowed us to see patients live many years on this combination therapy. The downside really is that lymphatinib is an incredibly toxic drug with multiple problems, uh, diarrhea, hypertension, fistula formation, weight loss, tooth loss, um, skin changes. It's terrible for patients, but it's very effective at controlling their cancer. And the biggest reason that patients come off study and progress is because they can't tolerate the lymphatinib anymore. So looking for less toxic but better versions of this combination therapy is really the focus of, of moving forward. And then last but not least, I think that uh, the combination of uh, really good preclinical data, incredible science, opportunities for patients to uh, enroll into clinical trials is really important because this is how we get uh, new, tr new drugs to patients. Um, and I hope that if anyone from the NCI ever listens to these kinds of talks that they recognize the power of the platform study, which allowed us to enroll um, six different combinations in a much shorter time frame uh, than has ever been before. Uh, we were recently told that the platform study design will no longer be funded by the NCI. Um, so we're going to have to come up with new and novel ways to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, we will keep pressing on. So what targets are we missing? So in my opinion, these are the three biggest targets that we're missing in endometrial cancer. First, racism. Structural racism continues to play an enormous role in access to gynecologic and health and uh, gynecologic oncology care. It also plays a role in the structures around how people can get health care, what information is available to them. It, it goes without saying that this is an enormous problem. There may also be some component component of environmental uh, toxins that result in these kinds of uh, terrible cancers. And uh, again, those teams seem to be centered ar around populations uh, who've been uh, pushed into different places to live. So we really have a lot of work to do in this area. The second area that I think uh, is a target that we're really missing is obesity. Obesity continues to expand. It's the largest uh, single cause of endometrial cancer in the United States. And there's been uh, very little change in the rate of uh, obesity in the population. Obese patients not only suffer from these cancers, but also suffer from the difficulties in treatment. Um, if a patient be uh, becomes uh, too big to operate on or has other medical conditions that make their surgeries very difficult or their treatments very difficult, they're unlikely to be able to benefit uh, as much as they could uh, if, they, if they weren't. And so we really have a huge uh, issue here and there's some really nice uh, activities happening within the SGO, but I really do think it needs to be a national focus as well. And third, uh, and not least, is TP53. So everybody knows, and the residents probably have heard me say this a million times, TP53 is the gene, uh, one of the most commonly uh, mutated genes in human cancer, if not the commonly uh, mutated gene in, in human cancer. And it turns out that elephants don't get cancer because they have multiple copies of P53, but we don't. So this is an area where we can think really crazily, like thinking CRISPR caspase to add extra P53s to us, or really think about ways that we can uh, start to tackle these huge um, drivers of cancer within our bodies and whether or not there are targetable agents uh, or other novel therapies to allow us to find these early cancers and attack them with uh, immunologic control. So really exciting stuff. That's where I think that the world is going. And this is uh, where I'm personally going to be focusing as well. All right. So big thank yous. Um, uh, Helen Mackay and David Bender, who have been uh, excellent co-eyes on GY12. Helen has been my uh, strongest mentor in endometrial cancer and super grateful. And then I'd like to thank my incredible division, the best humans uh, that I know doing this type of work, Andrew Lee, uh, Kenneth Kim, Kristen Taylor, Mike Manuel, and our brand new Maggie Liang. We're so grateful to have you. Um, and I put in a gratuitous picture of my children and my wife because I can, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, BJ. That was Thank really you. a great uh, talk, and I love seeing your family also. Um, do we have any questions for Dr. Rimel? Hi, Dr. Hi, BJ. It's, oh. oh, go ahead. It's Kristen. That was amazing. Um, Thank you. Which arm do you think will win of GY12? Oh. 
I That's know. Like picking your favorite I'm not going to hold you to it. I won't write it down, but I'm very curious what you think. Well, I anyway. think, okay, so I think, and I, I really, I shouldn't opine because um, there might be a patient listening who then won't go on. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I think that the that no matter what happens with the trial, that the lenvatinib uh, pembrolizumab combo is just incredibly toxic. And I think the sidirinib dervalimab combo may be as efficacious with less toxicity. And I think that that's going to be a win no matter what. I think that Shannon's arm with the alaparib and capivacertib is probably a win because Shannon wins everything. And because I think it's just a really smart combination. Um, I really love my arm, but uh, I think that the that alaparib probably isn't powerful enough on its own as a DNA damaging agent to get the kind of signal that is needed. I think it probably would need to be a triple arm combination, which was originally proposed. So we had a sidirinib, alaparib, and dervalimab combo proposed, but uh, we couldn't get funding for that arm. The company wasn't interested. Um, so I think that that's, um, that's, if I had to pin it down, that's what I think. Super. Any other questions? Hey, it's Karen Solke. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, um, BJ. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I, um, you, you, I understood about half of it, but um, the half that I understood was awesome. Um, I have a question from the, you know, general gynecology perspective about preventing endometrial cancer with Mirena IUD, for example. Um, and I know it hasn't been FDA approved, and I always have to say to my patients, you know, this is an off-label use of it. Um, do we have data that I'm not aware of um, in terms of how efficacious it is and how confident we can be that if a patient has, you know, postmenopausal spotting um, or bleeding with a marina that we're confident enough that, you know, we don't have to sample her or should we still be sampling? Um, uh, That's such opinions. a good question. That's such a good question. I don't, I mean, so there's not data about postmenopausal Mirena IUD use in the setting of prevention. I think that's a great opportunity because I'm sure that there are lots of patients at Cedars who are doing that. We do have data on the lower risk of um, endometrial cancer, sort of like from a population standpoint of ever use of a levonorgestrel IUD, which does reduce the risk. Um, but again, it's like risk fold. It's hard to tell a patient like how much risk that is. For a postmenopausal patient who has a levonorgestrel IUD in place that is spotting, and it's not early in the course, like maybe they haven't had any bleeding for a year and they're spotting now, I would tend to go ahead and take a look at least with ultrasound to ensure that the lining is under five millimeters. And then if it's you know, if it is, but they're still spotting, I still might sample them. I haven't seen anybody have a breakthrough cancer, but I certainly wouldn't want to be the one to ignore it. Um, and since age is a bigger risk factor than anything, I would, you know, especially if my patient is older, I might go ahead and sample them. Hi, this is Bryna. That was an outstanding um, the grand round. So thank you, Dr. Rama, always for your grace and intelligence and commitment. Um, just to uh, add, um, there's the progestin IUDs and progestin contraception all told, um, all pr prevent um, endometrial cancer with a risk reduction of 50%. So that's pretty steady across all of them, but you're right, um, not, um, not treatment except for in the case of prevention of endometrial hyperplasia with um, tamoxifen therapy. So there's, we can infer a few things, but it would be really fun to look at our population and see if we could learn more. Definitely. I'm going to take a question from the chat from Dr. Hirsch. Any discussion of using drugs like Ozempic or Wegovy as an adjunct to progestin therapy for obesity-mediated endometrial hyperplasia cancer? That is an excellent question. Um, that is something that I've heard discussed, um, but I have not seen anyone put forward a trial proposal partially because uh, the way that clinical trials move forward, this is just like a trials thing, 
is that the companies that make the drugs that you want to use in combination need to be willing to work together and be willing to share the financial fallout potentially of whatever the the thing is, right? So imagine if you own Ozempic and you own progestins or whatever, and you both decide that you're going to go in together, but it turns out that the combination doesn't result in effectiveness. So you don't get the new label, but you spent all the money for the trial. And for companies like Ozempic and Wegovi, they have so much market share and so much money to be made. There's no incentive for them to do it. So the only place to do it is through the NCI. The NCI has only a short list of drugs that are available through something called the CRADA. The CRADA is the list of drugs available through drug companies who are contracted either by law because they took money from the government or contracted because they're wonderfully um, kind or because they recognize that as a business proposition, they're happy for the NCI to pay for the clinical trials. And so there's a list of drugs available. Um, it turns out that Ozempic and Wegovi are not on the CRADA, so you can't run it through the NCI. So you'd have to have a relationship somehow with the drug companies and get them to do it. So this is just where it gets exciting. Um, so the kinds of studies that you're proposing are brilliant, need to be done, but actually get done through something called implementation science, where you decide that you're going to examine a population prospectively and implement for them a weight, a weight loss strategy and then also implement for them a progestin-based strategy. So they're not really randomized controlled gold standard studies. They end up being sort of like our population studies that are done uh, that way. And you look at the implementation of both of those drugs and see what happens. But it's an excellent question. And you brought up an excellent point about how challenging it is to do really good um, science about a topic that really um, you know, just doesn't get done. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, BJ. See Thank you. you. Have a great day. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.